context. Now, I would like to start um, all the way back, but we don't have time to do that. It is quite possible to begin at verse 35, where Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and this includes the men who have rowed across the lake after the feeding of 5,000. This is what prompts the discussion of spiritual bread, spiritual food. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Now, I just point out in passing that the focus here is upon Jesus. Who is Jesus? It never leaves Jesus. Jesus is absolutely central to all of this. That's why the Roman Catholic understanding of verses 50 and following is just completely out of order. Jesus says, Ego aimi ha artas. I am the bread of life. I myself am the bread of life. The one coming to me, want to hunger, the one believing me would never thirst. The very first references to hungering and thirsting are clearly spiritual. They are fulfilled by spiritual actions. And therefore, what comes later needs to be interpreted in light of that. But we're not getting into that today. But that is the literal meaning of John 6, which is not eating Jesus' flesh and blood, as in literally. Jesus establishes that in verse 35. But I said to you that you have seen me and you are not believing. So what must be taken into account in any interpretation, and by the way, Beaumont doesn't even try this. He does not offer an exegesis this text at all. Doesn't even, doesn't even try. It's all Venn diagrams and, and logical errors and, and stuff like that. Does not even pretend to offer any kind of meaningful exegesis of the text. Nothing. Says a lot. Says a lot. Jesus is explaining the unbelief of even the men who have rowed across the lake looking for him. These are, they, they were seeking after Jesus. He even uses the term they tell to seek after him. That is the context then of verse 37. And I have never said, never even intimated that verse 44 is understandable outside of the context in which it is found. The categories of given, the role of the father, the role of the son, who is giving, what coming to the Son means, all of that must begin back here. So when Beaumont starts criticizing what I've said with, by ignoring that and only later goes, well, you know, he might say verse 37 is relevant. Yeah, like in every published presentation I've ever made on it. That's a demonstration, again, of just how badly this article was, was written. Um, <laughs> verse 37, God's ultimate authority in salvation, first and foremost, all that the Father gives me. No system that denies to the Father the right to unilaterally, freely, sovereignly give to the Son can be described as a biblical system. I would say that the majority of systems that call themselves Christians today are not based upon that. They do not begin with a recognition that the Father has the absolute sovereign right as king to give a people to the Son, not based upon what they do. That is the essence of biblical truth. Now, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one coming to me, I will never cast out, error subjunctive of strong denial. All who are given by the Father to the Son come to Christ. What does coming to Christ mean? Well, in verse 35, it was paralleled with belief. Coming, believing. Coming, believing. This is not foreseen faith because what action precedes the other? 
in this text, there is no question that it is the giving of the Father that results in the coming of those who are given to Christ. So you cannot say the Father foresees that they are going to believe and on that basis gives them because it is his giving that results in their coming and believing. So, saving faith is the result of being given, not the grounds, foreseen or otherwise, of being given. Then Jesus says he never casts out the one coming to him. Those who come are those who have been given. None else. And if you want to introduce the idea that there are people who can come to Jesus who were not given by the Father, you can't get it from John 6. You've got to drag it in from someplace else. And that's exactly what people do. At some point or another, either at the very start, people say this is only about the Jews, they go into hyper-dispensationalism, there's all sorts of ways that people try to get around this text. But it always requires bringing in something from outside to do that. You're not going to get it by simply allowing the words to speak for themselves. You're just not going to do it. It's not going to happen. So, Verses 38 and 39 expand upon the final phrase in verse 37 and explain why he will never cast out those given to him. What does he say? Because I have come down from heaven, not in order to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. This is the will of the one who sent me in order that of all that he's given to me, he switches to the neuter there, so it, it, it becomes a group. That of all that he has given to me, I lose none of it, the group, but raise it up on the last day. The Father's will for the Son is for him to be a perfect Savior. Not a really good Savior. Not a really good potential Savior. The Father's will for the Son is that he save every single one that the Father has given to him. You can see why this is such an important text, because it's not who free, used their free will to do X, Y, or Z, and all, you know, fulfilled sacramental penances and all the rest of this kind of stuff, which can allow you to put Jesus out somewhere where he's just sort of making things possible. No, no. But then notice at the end of verse 39 but I will raise it up on the last day. If the Son raises one up on the last day, those thusly raised have eternal life. They have eternal life. Now remember, coming, raised up, eternal life. Being raised up on the last day is receiving eternal life. They are coterminous concepts. You can't divide them up. You can't say one's one thing, one's another thing. No. Sun raises one up on the last day. Those thusly raised have eternal life. That raising up on the last day equals eternal life is established in verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, in order that everyone looking upon the Son, Theoron is a present tense participle, ongoing, looking at the Son and believing in Him, I think in John, very clearly, the use of the present there over against Eris for unbelievers is purposeful on his point, on his part. It's, it, it, it speaks to the continuation of the action. The one believing, I'm sorry, the one looking upon the Son and believing in him, him has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. See, the two are brought together. Raise up on the last day, given eternal life, brought together. All right? So we've already established this. This is the context that must be established because it's the context that continues in verse 44. 
The order is very vital. Beholding and believing are the result of being given, not the ground of being given. Beholding and believing. Who's doing the beholding and believing? So, you see, some people want to try to jump in here of ignore what came before. Forget about 37 to 39. Do it backwards. Norman Geisler did it backwards in Chosen, Chosen But Free. Did it backwards. There is a progression. You go from one thought to the next thought. You allow things to be defined. If you have to take this thought out and ignore what came before it, you're obviously not wanting to listen to what the person's actually saying. So, beholding and believing are what we do because we have been given by the Father to the Son. That's what coming to Him is. Beholding and believing. That's not, that is the result of being given, not the ground. Now, after the grumbling of the Jews, Jesus explains their continued unbelief. And that's when we get to verse 44. Verse 43, Jesus answered, and said to them, do not grumble amongst yourselves. And then for some reason, Beaumont raises issues of translation. Now, there really aren't any translational issues. There's a few minor textual variants that do not impact the meaning of the text at all. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. That's a literal Perfectly fine translation, and if Beaumont wants to try to argue with it, I challenge him, put it out there. Put it out there. No one is able to come to me. No one has the capacity or ability to come to Christ in and of themselves. Now, I ask the question here, how many really believe this? How many really believe this? I mean, even in evangelical Protestantism today. This is a minority view because of tradition, not because of exegesis, because of tradition, because of the way that we've been taught to do things. No one has the capacity or ability to come to Christ in and of themselves. The Father must draw anyone for them to be capable of coming to the Son. No one is able to come to me unless the Father, the one who sent me, draws him. And this, of course, is where we then encounter the real issue. Just here we must see the error of all synergistic attempts to get around this text. The one coming in verse 44 is, of course, identical with those who come in verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. So who is the Father drawing? Those he's given to the Son. They are coterminous groups. Hence, the giving of verse 37 and the drawing of verse 44 have the same audience. If one is given, one will be drawn by the Father. If one is given, one will be drawn. This is what I mean by allowing the text to define its own categories. Follow the flow of thought. Once the audience is identified in one verse, when three verses later, the same audience comes up, and now a new description is given, this expands our understanding. You can't just jump into one verse and make stuff up, and then jump into another verse someplace. That's not how you do exegesis. Maybe how you do philosophy, but it's not how you do exegesis. But vitally, the one who is drawn is also the one who is raised up and given eternal life. And this is that key issue that when it says, Halkuse uh, Alton, I will raise, uh, uh, draw him, then it says, Kago Anasteso Alton, and I will raise him up. The two Altons are the same. You cannot introduce a distinction. Most synergistic theology introduces a distinction. 
and says that the first him is everybody. The second him is the one who makes the choice. No such distinction exists in the text. All who are given by the Father to the Son are drawn by the Father to the Son, and the Son raises them up to eternal life. This is what these people are desperate to avoid. Because if this is true, the entire sacramental system of Rome is a lie from the pit of hell. That's the problem. That's the problem. Rome cannot have an absolutely sovereign God and a Jesus who actually saves. Well, they don't have one anyways because of the Mass, but that's another issue. Well, it's a very directly related issue, but it's, it's another, another issue. So, verse 45 continues. Let's go, let's go a verse beyond it, shall we? Verse 45 continues the same thought. Quoting from Isaiah 54, 13, provides the ground of the assertion that everyone who has heard... Remember hearing in the Gospel of John, seeing in the Gospel of John. Remember John chapter 9, seeing but not seeing, hearing but not hearing. It's John 8, there's a whole discussion of it, John 10, so on and so forth. It's, it's all through it. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father is coming to me, he says. Hearing and learning from the Father is the same thing as being drawn in verse 44. How does he draw those that he's given to the Son? There is a revelational experience, which we call regeneration. It's how God reveals the Son to sinners and raises them out of spiritual life, and that is natural then for them to put their faith in Jesus Christ, their Redeemer. The result, as verse 45 says, all who hear and learn. And by the way, hearing and learning are passive activities. You hear but what you're hearing is coming from outside you. When you learn, what you're learning is coming from outside you. These are not things that find their origin and source within man. They are passive activities. All who hear and learn, that's further description of what being drawn is, come to the Son. Just to let, just stay here in John 6 and says, who comes to the Son? Given by the Father, drawn by the Father, hear and learn from the Father. It's all God. The result is every one of them comes to the Son. And he will never cast them out. Hence, given by the Father, drawn by the Father, hear and learn from the Father, all equals come to me. This is simple exegesis. This is allowing the text to speak for itself in its own context. Not pulling stuff in from outside, not jumping to other texts, following the flow of thought. That's the power of John chapter 6. That's the power of John chapter 6. So, with that said, uh, you might want to pull that down. With that said, the article, uh, we've already learned that... Uh, we're not to trust me because I'm dumb and things like that. Uh, quotation from the ESV. And then there's some weird statements in this article. That's the translation of the Reformation Study Bible, but here are a few more in case its accuracy is doubted. For comparison, here is James White's translation and commentary on the verse, which he got from the website, not from the book itself. Note that from the statement, no one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise up in the last day. White gets, all who are drawn are also raised up. In White's view, then, being drawn guarantees coming to Christ, which guarantees being raised up. Now, how did I establish that? How did I just establish that? By going back to verse 37 and walking straight through. I allowed the text to define the terms. As will be shown, even on White's translation, such an interpretation is objectively illogical. Objectively illogical. So now we're going to have a philosophical demonstration of the logic of Jesus' own words. What we're actually going to get is a demonstration of why philosophers should not pretend to be exegetes. That's what we should get. Okay, that's what we should see here. Logic 101. Yeah, I've never studied logic, never even taught logic, even though actually taught Christian philosophy religion. But anyways, 
Logic is essentially a means of precising common language into a form that can be objectively evaluated. This involves a bit of restatement, but fortunately the verses in question are pretty straightforward. I'll discuss White's understanding according to the two most basic logical methods, such as categorical logic. When a statement is expressed with words like all, some, or none, then categorical logic is the go-to method. It's simple and it's simple and are restated quite intuitively. Okay, that's just what it says. So let's compare a logical rendition of John 6:44 with White's interpretation of it and see if they match. A logical rendition. Well, that's interesting. How about we just render it in English from the Greek language and follow? Well, why, Dr. Beaumont, why are you starting verse 44? I didn't. I didn't in what you quoted. I didn't in my books. Why are you doing that? Because you're misrepresenting me. That's why. And you've been caught. And we're now documenting it for many, 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 many people to see. There are only four categorical propositional proposition forms. Subject, predicate, all S is P, no S is P, some S is P, and some S is not P. To keep the logic clear, double negative statements like no one unless are restated into positive assertions. That is, one would not use no S is not P. Aren't you glad that... Jesus spoke a little bit more clearly than these people do. In categorical terms, then, no one can come to me, Christ, unless the Father who sent me draws him would be stated as, all those who come to Christ are those drawn by the Father. Now, that bails and dumps the key element of verse 44. And, of course, it's not... All of this, just, just right now, jumping in at verse 44 is misrepresentational, it's straw man, it's dishonest, it, it, it's just confused. Uh, we've already established categories. Anyone who actually teaches logic knows you have to establish your categories before you can bring a critique to any part of the statement. But anyway, um, so the, one of the key issues here is the inability of man apart from the enablement of the Father. That's That's lost by this quote-unquote restatement. All those who come to Christ are those drawn by the Father. The reality, the, the only way that that can actually be evaluated is to go back and do what I did. What does verse 37 say? What does verse 38 and 39 say? What is verse, how does verse 40 expand upon that? How is that then applied in verse 44? That's the only way to do it, and that's what he does not do. And that, that should be enough. We could stop right here and say, have a nice day. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll talk about uh, the fight going on between the two popes and stuff like that. And we, that would be a sufficient refutation, but we're really not done. Um, so he puts, a, puts together a uh, diagram. Uh, all who are drawn by the Father, all who come to Christ. Note that anyone in the coming to Christ category are also in the drawn by the Father category. However, not all in the drawn by the Father category are in the coming to Christ category. And now, you, you, can you put this up? So, by pretending to be Mr. Philosopher Man here, you are introducing entire categories into the context of John 6 that are nowhere in John 6. They're nowhere in John 6. This is how you do eisegesis while making it look like you know what you're talking about when you're not, you're not even close. And no, notice he's had to rephrase things. No one can come to me. He's talking to unbelievers. He's explaining their unbelief. That's not here. You can't put that into this little diagram. So you're torturing the text. Absolutely torturing it. So what this does is this introduces, by putting this into a foreign context, by isolating it from its context, the idea that there is a larger sphere, that there are people who are drawn but don't come. All that the Father gives me will do what? Come to me. 
See, once you allow 37 and 44 to exist in the same dialogue, this stuff falls on its face as well it should. Note that anyone in the coming to Christ category are, are also in, uh, okay. However, not all in the drawn by the Father category are in the coming to Christ category. Now, we've already demonstrated the error of this exegetically. We've already demonstrated that everyone, everyone learning from the Father, everyone drawn by the Father to the Son are raised up by the Son. Do you see the sophistry here? This is Romanism in its full flower, folks. That's why I wanted to do this. Rome has used sophistry for centuries to enslave people to a false gospel. Here, this is why I wanted to do this. Here in Douglas Beaumont's words, you can see sophistry being used to destroy the text of Scripture while pretending to honor it. While pretending to honor it. But I, I want you to see the, the mechanism by which this is happening. This is how you bring things in from the outside. This is what is done to these poor, benighted souls that go to Roman Catholic seminaries and get this stuff crammed in their head all day long. This is why they really believe that what Rome is teaching is true. But it's a lie, and you're seeing it right here. We've already demonstrated all the Father gives the Son come to the Son. That the Father gives the people the Son, it's His will that He raise them all up. No one is able to come unless the Father who sends draw him, and Jesus will draw that, will raise that one up on the last day. We saw verse 40 said that's faith. That's being raised on the last day, having saving faith. And then verse 40 finished it off, uh, verse uh, 45 finished it off. All who hear and learn from the Father come to me. All destroys this. That, this picture you're seeing refuted by a simple reading of the text. From John, now notice, from John 6.44 alone, see down there? From John 6.44 alone, we cannot know how either category is actually populated, but we do know that this is their relationship. Well, there's your problem, Dr. Beaumont. No one is going to John 6.44 alone. Here, though, is James White's interpretation. All those drawn by the Father are those who come to Christ. As you can see, this is not the same thing. In fact, it is the opposite of one, what John 6.44 says. White commits a classic fallacy. Ready now, folks? This is how a sophist turns Jesus' own words on their own head. Remember, this is a man who now thinks that Jesus is sacrificed upon an altar every time a man who claims to be an altar Christus says the proper words. This is the man who's left the gospel. As you can see, this is not the same thing. In fact, it is the opposite of what John 6, 44 says. White commits a classic fallacy known as illicit conversion. This occurs when a universal truth is asserted of a subject, but then the universal qualifier gets switched to the predicate. For example, the statement, all of my cars are blue cars, cannot be logically converted to all blue cars are my cars. Now, let's just ask a simple question here. Did I ever do that? No, obviously, I never did. Beaumont has created a misrepresentation, a pure straw man, by ignoring three published books on the subject, dozens of sermons, entire debates, all to come up with a misrepresentational straw man that ignores the fact that I established the categories beginning back in verse 35 all the way through. All the way through. So, if the very first argument collapses upon the slightest examination, we don't have to spend too much more time about this. But I do want to, uh, he then plays around with, with propositional logic, which is irrelevant because, again, he's misrepresented everything that I've said. But then, after all his vaunted logical knowledge has been placed out there for everyone to go, oh, that's wonderful, then, John 6, 37. But maybe there is more to James White's interpretation of John 6, 44 than just John 6, 44. You think? You think maybe there might be something to that? <laughs> wow.
Wow. Indeed. White connects John 644 to John 637 to support his interpretation. No, sir. This is how you do exegesis. What were you doing at Southern Evangelical Seminary? Did you sleep through the exegesis classes or did they just not offer them? I am stunned. All the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Now, if gives in John 6.37 and draws in John 6.44 mean the same thing, then it would logically support White's interpretation. <laughs> this is because, categorically, we would have two statements that reinforce each other. All those the Father gives are those who come to Christ. All those who come to Christ are those drawn by the Father. Now, this is, of course, ignoring the flow. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was some exegesis somewhere here, you know, pretend to actually deal with the text, to allow the categories of verse 37 to then be expanded upon in verses 38 and 39, then verse 40 even sheds more light upon it, and then we would have a solid basis for looking at verse 44, and then we could look at verse 45. Wouldn't that be wonderful? That's how you're supposed to do it. That's how you're supposed to do it. Hey, maybe he was never taught this stuff. I don't know. I don't know. So, between the two, we'd have overlapping categories that included all of each. So now we have a new little... I think someone just wanted to do some graphics, personally. But Similar results obtained for propositional logic. It could be said that coming to Christ is a sufficient condition for the Father's drawing, per John 6.44. Um, wait a minute. It could be said that coming to Christ is a sufficient condition for the Father's drawing. No, 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 no. And is a necessary condition for being given by the Father. Upside down! John 6, 37, it is the giving of the Father that results in our coming to Christ. Okay, um, let, me, let me just look at this real quickly, could we? Um, uh, he looked at verse 40, uh, 45. Here, here's... Uh, da -da 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 -da. Here, it, it's, it is perfectly consistent with John 6, 37 to 44 to believe that God the Father draws all people but only gives some to Christ the Son, resulting in their salvation. That may not be Calvinistic, but it is scriptural. Only theological bias appears to tip the scales one way or the other. Thus, White's, despite White's posturing, he truly fails the logic on this one. Well, of course, it was Beaumont that completely failed logic and exegesis 101. But what's fascinating here is it is perfectly consistent to believe that God the Father draws all people, but only gives some to Christ the Son. Did anyone see anything anywhere in John 6 that said anything like that at all? Nothing. He never even makes reference to the fact that Jesus is explaining their unbelief. How is this possible? Because what the Bible says is not his final authority. He's Roman Catholic. It's what Rome teaches. It's what Rome teaches. This is the difference between doing biblical exegesis and doing Roman Catholic posturing, which is what Beaumont has done in this context. And of course, he continues, he finishes off by saying, uh, now, everyone makes mistakes, and it would be unduly triumphalistic to make a huge deal out of one little misinterpreted verse. A excuse me, um, Dr. Beaumont, if you're ever going to accuse me of misinterpreting a verse, and you do not offer any meaningful original language-based exegesis, you are going to do a face plant, which is what you just did. It's what you just did. Don't publish articles where you accuse people of misinterpreting verses when you didn't even bother to try to establish any meaningful exegesis of this text at all. At all. Horrific. This problem however, is a big one for James White. For one thing, this passage is one of White's go-to proof texts for his brand of Calvinism, so his misreading of it is especially damaging to his case. Well, and my demonstration of the fact that you haven't even touched my reading of it might mean something about your case for Catholicism, right? Must be. More importantly, though, this particular failure is troubling because the mistake White makes should be so obvious to anyone who has even dabbled in introductory logic. Hmm. Surely a subject to which he was at least introduced during his PhD program. Yeah, actually, I've taught the Christian philosophy of religion. So, yeah, mm hmm I just recognize the difference between introductory logic and something called exegesis. While White often demonstrates an impressive ability to cite various sources in Greek lexicons, those are just data. 
And data uninterpreted is useless. Worse, data misinterpreted can be seriously misleading. Given the number of times white has been shown this particular error, zero, it is deeply concerning that it retains his interpretation, continues to make the same argument for it. What does such a failure say about the rest of his theological reasoning ability? Well, folks, I will gladly, I will gladly put what we just presented from the text of John 6 up against this mishmash of sophistry any day of the week. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, man, you sure are hard on that guy. You've been nicer to, to Muslims. 